This is MRN Out Loud on MRN.com, presented by Bloomin' Mondays at Outback Steakhouse. And also brought to you by Hercules Tires. Ride on our strength. Hello again, everyone. MRN Out Loud. Woody Kane alongside Joey Meyer, as usual, and a special guest in the house. Keith Barnwell from GMS is going to join us. We'll talk a little spotting as we move through the program. But first, guys, Kyle Busch finally gets number 200. And there's a raging debate on social media, as we were talking about before the show. Is it as good as Richard Petty's? Is it worse? Is it, and I'm just of the opinion that it's apples and oranges. It's, it's apples and, and Sherman tanks. It, yeah. It's irrelevant. Uh, of whether it's the same, it's still a, an amazing accomplishment done in today's day and time with mm-hmm. three different series uh, amongst many owners. He hasn't driven for one owner himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and right now he's going to go down as one of the best drivers uh, that, that we've been able to witness. Now, just like Jimmy Johnson, just like Dale Earnhardt, just like the Daryl Waltrips of the world, we don't appreciate how good they are until they're gone, until mm-hmm. they're retired. Everybody booed the drivers that I just mentioned, for years <laughs> until they were at the end of their career or out of the car. Yeah. And that's what we're experiencing now. Jimmy Johnson, seven-time champion, still relatively booed, uh, if not cheered, as, as his accomplishments are. Um, and it's really weird to see how we don't appreciate the people that are really good in our sport. It's that way in a lot of things, isn't it, Keith? I mean, in a lot of sports, a lot of different walks of life, we don't realize what we had until we don't. Right, absolutely. I think one thing to think about with Kyle is he has done it for Mm -hmm. multiple teams, different owners, himself as an owner also. But if you win 200 races at South Boston or Hickory Speedway, you're a legend. Mm -hmm. How can he not be? How can you not? Yeah, with what he did. He's absolutely unbelievable. Um, From his first race until yesterday, he's been in the hunt every week. And, so, and 53, all the other aside, 53 cup races is nothing to sneeze at. Absolutely. That, that's a short list. Right. And and watching Mark Martin years and years ago, you think, guy's got 50 wins. Mm-hmm. He'll never be beat. Mm-hmm. He's getting ready to double what Mark has won. And here's the thing. Mark Martin got in the Hall of Fame. The guy that Kyle passed to get the most truck wins of all time is in the Hall of Fame. Sure. Love him or hate him. Kyle Busch is going to the Hall of Fame. There is no question. If he doesn't, something's wrong. He was going to go in the Hall of Fame before he won a championship. The Mm -hmm. championship guarantees his way in, and now with the 200 wins over three series, he's if there's a double guarantee, he's got it now. All right. To your point earlier, Daryl, let's uh, get number three. To your point earlier, Joey, about the guys being booed along the way, Kyle was asked about that after he got the victory yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like my fan base has been picking up over the years just of, of growing up a little bit. You know, obviously, I turned off plenty back in the early days, and and uh, you're never going to change those minds, which is fine. But, um, you know, there's certainly some that are kind of turning the table or turning the corner a little bit as to uh, seeing about more of what's today, um, who I am today, and, and the growing up that I've done. But overall, just, um, you know, I think that winning obviously kind of helps that. Um, you know, I, I certainly have to give a huge – Shout out and praise to the Rowdy Nation fans that have been with me since the beginning, that have been with me since the the five Kellogg's days or, heck, even my Xfinity days um, before I was a cup guy, whatever. So uh, I'm even in Las Vegas when we go out there and I sign autographs at M&M's World, um, there's people that I see there that come out that I remember seeing at the bowl ring in Las Vegas, you know, and, and they're still Kyle fans. So um, those are the core group that I certainly am very uh, appreciative of and, and that are very passionate about me. You know, to me, that's one of the most interesting things about Kyle over the years is watching him kind of embrace that role. I mean, every good story needs conflict, right? And the conflict is people who don't like him versus the achievements that he's making and continues to make. I think that's just a cool dynamic watching that over the years evolve. Years ago, we had manual scores for these race cars. And he mentions his original time starting up in the Bush Series, Xfinity Mm -hmm. Series Nationwide. Years ago, I was spotting for Martin Truex. And we're racing against Kyle Busch. Mm-hmm. Kyle's running us very hard. And as we tend to do on the roof, we talk bad about the guy we're racing. <laughs> Bono, Bono, who, Kevin Mannion is our crew chief. Yep. And he's saying, Joey, enough. And I'm just, I'm laying into Kyle. You know, just laying into him on the radio. <laughs> Martin says, well, he's right, you know, talking to Kevin Bono. <laughs> right? Talking to, you know, everything I was saying was right. Yeah. 
we had manual scores. Mm-hmm. Gabe Bush was our score. K- Kyle's mom. Now oh, the scores were headsets, no. so they hear everything we're oh, saying. Oh no! And I was bashing her son oh. on our radio. Did you find her later? No. And talk, no. Have, have you ever she, talked to no, her about? I've never this? talked to her. Oh, she has no God. idea. You really should. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah that <laughs> might be good. But Gay and Tom, we see we Gay Bush and Tom Bush. We see them at the track all the time. They've grown up in that racing family. Mm-hmm. They're used to that. They, uh, Kurt Bush is is Kyle's brother. They haven't been on the popularity list. And again, the reason they're not popular is because they're successful. They're a threat to somebody else's lack of success, Mm -hmm. and that's what Kyle represents. Because he's won 200 races over a 15, 18-year period, it means somebody else hasn't been winning, and he's that threat, and that's why he's not liked. Yeah, the percentage is way up there, too. I think it's something ridiculous, like 20% of the races he's in, the guy wins, and that's, that's insane. No question. Uh, little Joey almost forgot. Yep. <laughs> Outback Steakhouse. Kevin Harvick got another top 10. If you're listening on a Monday and you go by Outback Steakhouse, they will give you mm. the free, free. Bloomin' Onion. Free. And there's nothing better than free stuff. we got to take a break on MRN Out Loud. Keith is here to talk the history of spotting with us. He and Joey are going to get into some stories that you won't want to miss. Stay with us, everyone. G'day, America. It's the moment you've all been waiting for. That's right. Outback Delivery is here. Now you can enjoy all your Outback favourites anywhere. Our signature centre-cut sirloin at home. It's here. Or game day party platters with kookaburra wings that'll have both teams cheering. It's here. Or steak and lobster for a date night at home. It's here. Head over to Outback.com and place your orders because Outback delivery is here. Outback Steakhouse. Aussie rules. Delivery availability varies. Delivery charge may apply. Bubba Wallace bringing the legendary petty colors up the back straight away. Bubba Wallace here. You know winning doesn't just happen overnight. To finish first, everything needs to come together to create the perfect combination. STP understands that. Using advanced formula, STP Ultra 5-in-1 Fuel System Cleaner every 4,000 miles destroys harmful deposits to help restore gas mileage. A winning combination to help restore peak performance in any gasoline vehicle. STP. Science. Technology. Performance. You're smart, got your own trucking business, making it happen. What if I told you there was a place online where you could connect with other smart owner operators just like you? It's an online community called Team Run Smart, where people share advice on truck maintenance, fuel savings, healthy habits on the road, and so much more, all to make your business more profitable. And it's all free. Visit TeamRunSmart.com today to check it out. You'll be glad you did. TeamRunSmart.com, brought to you by Freightliner Trucks. Back on MRN Out Loud, it is STP Week here at the Motor Racing Network as we get ready to head to Martinsville for some genuine short track racing or genuine if you're in North Carolina. And we'll see uh, how that plays out. I don't think the package is going to be that much of a factor at Martinsville as it might be, say, at a Bristol. I don't think qualifying is going to be as crazy as it has been since drafting shouldn't be a factor uh, at Martinsville. But here we go, guys. Back to short track racing. Yeah, I look forward to it. I love Martinsville. Uh, I've been going there for you know almost 20 years uh, myself love just love the history 1947 mm-hmm. that's one of our oldest racetracks uh good good short track racing uh, if you don't like martinsville i don't know what else to give you can't help you right because we all <laughs> because when we went to our first tracks as kids growing up whether we were driving a go-kart or whatever we didn't start out at two mile tracks we yeah. started out at small tiny bumper to bumper kind of tracks and Your weekly short track. and martinsville represents yeah. that absolutely it does all right well joey since you have brought company to the house today why don't <laughs> yeah. you introduce our guest you know uh, so long time ago we were in the off season we were talking about uh spotting and, mm-hmm. and i've been doing it now a little over 20 years and it seems that i've been doing it a long time but i knew from my history that i really haven't been in the sport that long uh, when I got into spotting, I was a second spotter. We used to race, uh, use a second spotter at, at speedways and, and road courses. And so I picked up the phone, and we were talking about some history uh, of spotting. And no, none other than my friend Keith Barnwell, back in 2003, I was spotting for a driver, an up-and-coming driver in the Bush Series. And he was, he was a little, little aggressive driver, mm-hmm. um, very well-known at the time. And my driver got off a of turn three. We're at Richmond. Mm-hmm. Uh, and got back up on the track uh, right in the middle of traffic and absolutely caused mayhem going into turn three. <laughs> that's a fair. That's this, a fair. This, <laughs> this gentleman next to me came down and wanted to throw me 
<laughs> off the roof, and that's how I met Keith Barnwell. Oh, well, great. That's yes. a good way to start yes. off a relationship, yeah, isn't great. it? But, yeah. but it's interesting how when we think about how long we've been around spotting and really where did the spotting come from, the stories that I picked up the phone, and I bet we were on the phone for close to an hour. At, at least, yeah. And, and it was really – I walked the dog twice. Y- y- right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and we really had no idea, and, and we started investigating and talking about really, again, where did it come from? How mm-hmm. did it start? Uh, and and I, I really have no place to ask other than how did it start, and, and where were you? The story you told me sitting on the back of the ramp truck. Yeah, Hickory yeah. Speedway. There you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Hickory yeah. Speedway. Yeah. So a guy from, uh, I'm from the big city of Hudson, oh, North yeah. Carolina. Oh, yeah, I know Hudson. Yeah, there we go. So... You know, we'd go to Hickory Speedway. That was kind of where we went and hung out and things like that. But I knew a guy. His name was Steve Lawrence. Um, Steve has since retired. Why am I still working? Yeah. You know. But <laughs> I don't Steve, know about your mailbox, but mine keeps on filling yeah, up with bills. Every, every day. Every day, you know. But um, went with Steve to Hickory Speedway. We actually had a CB radio mm-hmm. that was in the ramp truck that pulled. Oh, my gosh. We didn't pull the car. Rode the car it was it. to the racetrack. Oh, wow. And they had a slide window, so they would turn on the CB radio and hand me back a headset that I could, that would more than anything cancel noise. Mm-hmm. And I would talk on a CB radio. So you were in the speed. infield, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you just okay. go and turn yeah. in circles, you know? Wow. So thank goodness they weren't 300 miles, 300 lap races. <laughs> you would you have know. been dizzy, like Absolutely. the dizzy mat thing in a minor league baseball game. I, I, yeah. I, same thing, exactly. Yeah. We were but, able to, once, so once Keith and I started talking about this, we were able to, through Lauren Rainier, come up with a article, uh, one of the first mentions of actual spotters being used for the spotter purpose. Now, crew chiefs and drivers have been talking together for as long as they could do it, right? Communicate, yeah. But to use a spotter for the sole purpose of assisting the driver was mm-hmm. back in 1981 at Riverside Speedway. Bobby Allison had a very good relationship with Motorola, and they developed a, a particular type of radio to go in his race car mm-hmm. and utilize a separate guy to assist him getting around Riverside and ended up uh, winning that race because he missed a really big wreck at the end of that race at Riverside mm-hmm. and was able to win Riverside. Now, but, did that make people mad at the time? Well, it's interesting you say that because the spotter mentality didn't start out with fanfare like you would think. Not not tell, at all. Tell no, the, tell all. the New Hampshire story. That's a great story. Right. So honestly, one of the key things was talk about the radios. Most teams only had two radios. So if you had two radios, you got a driver and a crew chief. That's it. I mean, it was a luxury to have more than two or right. three radios yeah. on mm-hmm. a race team, yep. especially at a, you know, Bush series and small tracks, but, you know, and you'd have a few more at the cup level. But New Hampshire, we had gone to Maine, and we ran the Oxford 250, Mm -hmm. came back through New Hampshire the following week, and it was the first Bush series race, first race at New Hampshire Speedway. Yeah. Yeah. So in practice, you really wouldn't, you'd stand on the truck or whatever. Mm -hmm. So come race time, I thought, wow, this is a great place. So I go across the track and, I'm messing around. I go up the grandstands, and I'm looking around. I see an elevator, so I get on the elevator, go to the roof. Open the door. You're standing on the roof. This so is I, this is back before uh, Uber security. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You could go pretty much where you <laughs> yeah. wanted. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I get off, turn to the right. We all know where I'm talking about, guys mm-hmm. that are on the spotter stand. And I go out, and I'm on the roof. And I'm standing there, and I put my headset on. And uh, a gentleman from NASCAR walked out and said, what are you doing up here? I said, well, mm-hmm. I'm going to spot for my man Tommy Houston here. He's just number six. He said, you can't well, be Tommy up here. Houston, that's he great. He said, you man. cannot be up here. I said, why? Yeah, why? He said, you're creating an unfair advantage for your team for you to be on the roof. Well, I'm not stopping anybody else from coming up here. That's yeah. basically <laughs> what I said. You know? that's, but that's interesting to see how far we've come from sure. that. That was back in the early 90s? Yeah, or, uh, late 80s. Late 80s? Late 80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, competitive advantage as a spotter. Yeah, well, I mean, how is that any different? Roof. I'm right. mashing my right. accelerator to the floor, and the other guy is not. Was right. that your fault or his fault? Right. Well, and and at that point in time, we I tell everybody that that when we first started, we were defensive coordinators. Mm. We have become offensive coordinators right. overnight. Get it. You know, overnight in thirty years. Yeah. And you now know? we're and now we're timing how long it takes to leave pit road to get back to start finishing. <laughs> I, 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 absolutely. Right. You gotta have yeah. your notebook. So absolutely. so did you wind up being able to stay up there that day or not? 
I, I just walked down the steps and went to the top row of the grandstands and sat down. And you could still see fine. Sure, and, yeah. sure. Wow. I remember uh, Steve Arndt was the guy that owned Tommy's team at that, at that point with yeah. Mid-State Mills. And Steve would buy me a grandstand ticket, and I literally sat with his wife and family in the grandstands mm. at Charlotte. Uh, for the for the bush race, you know, wow. so it's come a long way. So, obviously. so from that point, how did it start to grow? Was it just a couple of more guys and a couple of more guys, and then boom, everybody was doing it, or how did it evolve? That's pretty much, yeah. I mean, when it when it first started, then that's why you can't really you'll you'll get guys that want to take credit for being the first spotter, right? Mm-hmm. Clearly, they weren't back with Bobby Allison in 1981. Yeah. But there was a group of people that were in the grandstands mm-hmm. that you didn't know who was in the grandstands. Right. There, there wasn't an official that was with all these guys. They were just randomly placed throughout the grandstands, and they were doing it. Wherever they could see well from. Exactly yeah. right. When I got into uh, the late 90s, we were only spotting for the race. We weren't required to do it for practice at mm-hmm. all. So at that time in the, in the late 90s, there was an official spotter stand with an official, and we had an area where guys went up and checked in. But it still wasn't mandatory on Fridays and Saturdays. And now it, everything is mandatory yeah, in that vein, yeah, yeah for yeah, safety yeah. safety reasons, That's which it. makes sense. Sure. Yeah. I love yeah. to tell the engineers that I've worked with in the past: we can start a race without an engineer, but you can't start without a spotter. Is Isn't it? that something? <laughs> yeah, that's something. Only, yeah, yeah, that's the only, truth. Though. And, I, I, and when I do a garage tour, because we can't believe how many people are there, there's only three people required to start a race: driver, crew chief, yeah. spotter. There you go. That's it. Everybody else, the only reason we have 20 people at the track is because the team next to us has, has 20 many. people it's a, at the it's track. It's an arms race. Yes, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so it's All right. And that's not to be disrespectful to the engineers. No, 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 no. <laughs> I got to work if with they those didn't guys. do their job, the car wouldn't do anything <laughs> when you get it to the track. Sure. Ask, yeah. ask Ricky. Oh, yeah. 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 How about that, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Let's take a quick break here on MRN Out Loud. We'll come back and talk spotting history next. G'day America, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. That's right, Outback Delivery is here. Now you can enjoy all your Outback favourites anywhere. Our signature centre cut sirloin at home. It's here. Or game day party platters with kookaburra wings that'll have both teams cheering. It's here. Or steak and lobster for a date night at home. It's here. Head over to Outback.com and place your orders because Outback Delivery is here. Outback Steakhouse, Aussie rules. Delivery availability varies. Delivery charge may apply. Bubba Wallace bringing the legendary Petty Colors up the back straight away. Bubba Wallace here. You know winning doesn't just happen overnight. To finish first, everything needs to come together to create the perfect combination. STP understands that. Using advanced formula, STP Ultra 5-in-1 Fuel System Cleaner every 4,000 miles destroys harmful deposits to help restore gas mileage. A winning combination to help restore peak performance in any gasoline vehicle. STP. Science. Technology. Performance. Citywide to countryside, whatever you drive, wherever you go. Hercules Tires has the value, selection, and industry-leading warranty to get you there, no matter where the road takes you. To learn more, visit HerculesTire.com. Hercules Tires, ride on our strength. Woody Kane and Joey Meyer with you on MRN Out Loud. Our special guest today is Keith Barnwell, and we're talking about how spotting came to be what it is today. But before we go further, Keith, GMS, tell us, uh, tell folks what you do full-time. I uh, work for GMS Racing. I've been there for three years. Uh, you know, I, I help with the day-to-day activities, the, you know, the travel, the, the, the running of the logistics, yeah. uh, being there. Uh, I help with the sponsors at track and, uh, Really, every I tell you know, people say, "What do you do?" I'm like, "I don't know." Depends on who calls next. That's like, "Hey, you." Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're, you're the so, next guy. Who can get this done? That's right. So, whenever the phone rings, it could change exactly what you're doing. But yeah, wonderful, wonderful place. Mike Beam, Maury Gallagher, mm-hmm. uh, that has been wonderful for me. And so, correct me uh, if I'm wrong. We're in 2019. You spotted yep, that's correct. Full you're right. Time up to 2017. I did. Yeah, yes, sir. I did. full-time. So we're talking back in the mid-80s, mm-hmm. full-time from mid-80s all the way to 2017. 
Yes. But now, but now, Joey says there was an incident at I don't know if incident's <laughs> the right word, a situation at, at Wilkesboro where you got pulled up there to spot at the last second. I did. Yeah, it was kind of funny. I had uh, I'd gone to Wilkesboro, taken my dad. We went over and watched practice, and we were just hanging out, spending some time. What year are we talking about, roughly? I'm gonna guess it would have been, gosh, early, probably mid nineties, mm-hmm. mid nineties. I assume mm-hmm. truck series, yep. truck series race there. Uh, the, the one thing I remember about it, I think it was the race where Ernie Irvin made his comeback. Okay. Mm, yep. Okay. After his injury. Isn't, isn't yeah. That, isn't that correct? Yeah. That's I, I where think he, you're right. Yeah. He, he, and he came back in a truck. So I'm literally walking down pit road and my dad and I are going to go out the back gate. Um, so, you know, which everybody remembers at Wilkesboro, they'd have a caution. Everybody run across the back stretch. <laughs> yeah. And uh guy handed me a radio. He said, Hey, where are you going? I said, um, over to the back stretch. We're going to watch a little of the truck race and then head out. He said, he hands me a radio and says, hey, how about spot for Toby? And and it was the ortho truck. I remember it had green grass on the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I'm like, okay. So I go to the back, and they're start, you know, gentlemen, start your engines. And I put the radio on, and they roll down pit road. And I'm like, uh, hey, Toby, this is Keith Barnwell. I'll be spotting for you here on the back stretch. <laughs> He's like, okay, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for helping Great us out. Great to meet you, yeah. <laughs> and next time by, we'll get one to go, you know. Wow. And you just. Wow. It, it was so much different, though, because, again, you, you didn't, you know, tell it like, back the corner up, do this, do that. You know, it was like you're either clear inside, outside. And it, even to that point, you didn't necessarily scan NASCAR. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so, mm-hmm. you know, you got a crew chief that's probably scanning NASCAR. Not only that, but he's sitting closer to the yellow flag than we are. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it was more of just a, a safety feature back then that has parlayed into, um, like I said, offensive yeah. coordinator. And, and the leaderboard was up on the scoring pile, and that was what we had. Right, yeah. You know, right. Now every spotter has a fan vision in front of them. We can figure out up to a thousandth of a second who's faster, who's slower, who's laps down, who's on what lap. Mm-hmm. Don't worry how about many this guy, go. yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because, again, when we first started, we carried the headset – Mm-hmm. And if you were really cool, you had two radios, and you clipped them on the back of the headset, and that's what you carried. There's no extra batteries, no extra cables, nothing, because you felt bad about taking two radios, as Keith mentioned earlier. Wow. Yeah. The, you had to find an extra radio in the closet there. Yeah, one there. that may not be charged in the exactly. back of, yeah, in the back of a drawer. And now, yeah. It's happened a million times. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and now, yeah, the worst thing you hear is, beep, beep, when you, turn, uh-huh. when you hit that push to talk. We've all had that. Oh, it's yeah. a dead battery. Great. Yeah. Well, right. that, all that meant was you didn't use that radio. Yeah. Right. Now, nowadays, I wear we wear backpacks or buffel bags that weigh in excess of forty pounds. I have more than five, six radios. I wear four at a time. We have extra cables and push the talks, and yeah, it's just the development of the spotters has really gone to where now we're more. You know, it's we started out as a safety device for sure, but now we can find back when Keith was part of the competition advantage. Mm-hmm. Now we yeah. try to do that. Now a good spotter will help his driver. Uh, from a young driver to an older driver, learn and get better during the race. Well, sometimes we assume we're helping. Well, right. yeah, we think, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. There are yeah. times when <laughs> you're told, "Hey, how about shut up for a second while I can run this corner?" Yeah, yeah. give me, give me a second. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, well, give me, give me an idea though. I'm interested in how things. We heard what Joey talked about in terms of how it is now, and you were spotting full time up until two, uh, 2017. Mm-hmm. But the evolution from back in the mid 90s, when you're talking about how did things kind of evolve and develop over time like that? You know, and, and I think it's just. It was more the lingo. I, honestly, it would be like, you know, there's not a lot you would say. It was mm-hmm. green flag, you know, cautions out, inside, outside. Mm-hmm. They're, they're just – and after you've done it as long as what we have, you kind of forget how you started. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and the one thing to remember, too, back in the 90s, it was unheard of for a race car driver to be under 30 years old. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, these guys were veterans of the right. sport. They had to earn their way into Ex- that ride. Right, yeah. and so you were spotting simply from the safety standpoint. If the caution came out, where the wrecks were, when pit road may be open, because the guy was waving a flag. Yeah, at and the this time. is still back in the days when you raced back. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly Absolutely. right. Yeah. So, yeah. but now with the evolution of the drivers becoming younger and younger and younger, they need the help. You would never tell Dale Earnhardt's spotter never told him to back up the corner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Didn't, you know, didn't need Terry Labonte, Eddie Mason yeah. Cup, and Terry Labonte, who are still together, they still work together. Eddie Mason Cup would not tell Terry Labonte, "Hey, I think you're overdriving turn one." Yeah, it just didn't. It wasn't that way because those drivers were they the, didn't need that. Correct, yeah, exactly right. Exactly. They were the veterans of the sport with the experience, but now 
I'm going to go spot for a new driver in Martinsville this weekend. We're trying to go have lunch tomorrow mm-hmm. just so I can meet him and get an idea of, of how he thinks about Martinsville and what things he's going to look for. So the, the evolution of the relationship is totally different in the last 20 years. Yeah. So I'll tell you something. Coming through the ranks and being kind of new, I, when we would go to Daytona, you would always have a guy in the Dash series. Mm-hmm. That would be yep. like, hey, man, I need somebody to spot for me. Well, Wayne Alton was running the Dash Series at that time, and Wayne would ask me every year. Is there year, anything Wayne hasn't done? Yeah, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne's a jack of all trades. <laughs> yes, he, he really is. is you know? <laughs> but, but Wayne would say, I need you to help me with the driver's meeting. And I would literally go to the driver's meeting, and he would say, you know, everybody here, um, Keith is a spotter, yada, yada. He went through the whole thing. And I would tell them, okay, you need to pay attention. You need to do this. You need to do that. Just kind of walk them through what they're going to hear. Because these guys ran on Saturday nights. They never had short had a, tracks. Yeah. yeah. And they, they never had spotters. a spotter. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you this I spotted for a guy there, uh, Will Hobgood. Oh, I remember him. Yeah. So, Racing Willie there, mm-hmm. he, he had never ran anything but dirt. And we go to Daytona, and, he, and, and the guy that owned his car said, Keith, if you don't mind, will you help Willie? And so we get in the race, and Willie's really good. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had a lot of talent, mm-hmm. and we're riding along, and Worked our way from like 10th or 11th, I think, up to 2nd. And he comes on the radio just as cool as a cucumber. And he said, you know, I think I can lead. And I said, okay, all right. So you stay where you are. Just stay in stay in line. So like the next lap, he came off turn two. And I said, okay, here's what you need to do. You're going to wave to the guy behind you. You're going to tell him to stay with you. I said, get your hand up where he can see you. I said, and when you come off two, pull out and pass him. So we come off turn two. He pulls out. The guy goes with him. Mm. We're leading the race, going down the back stretch. I said, okay, you're clear. He's clear. They both pulled down. He came by the start-finish line. I said, you're leading the race at Daytona. How about that? And he was just like a kid. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a great it, – it How was, old was he at the time? I, I got roughly. cold chills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he started later. he has been doing his dirt stuff for a long time Absolutely. before that. Yeah. I'm going to say he was in his 40s. <clears throat> yeah. But, you know, as a matter of – he he leaned on, and it was gratifying because people would lean on you for help at that time. Mm-hmm. Most everybody knows what's going on when they get here now, even though they're only 19 years yeah, old. Yeah, you know? right, right. But, but 19 it, but years old re- with 30 years of experience. <laughs> <Exactly. Yeah. laughs> but, but it was really interesting. We ran second that day. Mm-hmm. And the next year, we go to Daytona, and he said, I need you to spot for me. I said, ah, I wouldn't miss it. Yeah. And we won the race. How cool is that? So it was, you know, that was just way cool. Yeah. So the know? Dash the Dash series, I was able to spot for TJ Majors. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't remember amazing. he drove it. Yeah. 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 I didn't cool. remember that. Yeah. So I spotted for TJ at, at Daytona, <laughs> Charlotte, and Bristol in the Dash series. And, and, and at that yeah. time, he yeah. hadn't done any, any spotting no. or anything, No, well, he right? was, he, his claim to fame was he, you know, online racing at that time. Right, right. He'd done a little right. bit of late model stuff, but yeah, he was trying to come to the Dash Series. And the Dash I so series. wish Junior would have spotted for him. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> Wouldn't that be so cool? There's an episode right there, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a podcast. <laughs> yeah, sure it is. That's uh, Back in the day, in the late 90s, Dale would spot, right? Mm-hmm. But he would spot from his, co- from his bus or his camper or from the suite. And he, and he always talked, he would never use the headset. He would mm-hmm. always talk into the microphone. Yeah. And what you don't realize is the microphone on the handset is really, really powerful. It always sounded like God was talking to you. <laughs> but he spotted. Make sure you do this. Exactly, exactly what it sounded like. And he spotted Steve Park at Talladega when Mark Martin was running second and, and Steve was trying to win that race. And he mm-hmm. spotted. We had a spotter on the roof, but that guy wasn't doing a whole lot of talking. Dale was <laughs> yeah, spotting you just have deep. a seat. Exactly right. But he spotted from the camper the whole time. It was pretty funny. Yeah, that's cool stuff. All right, one more break here on MRN Out Loud. We'll talk a little more spotting history when we come back. Bubba Wallace bringing the legendary petty colors up the back straight away. Bubba Wallace here. You know winning doesn't just happen overnight. To finish first, everything needs to come together to create the perfect combination. STP understands that. Using advanced formula, STP Ultra 5-in-1 Fuel System Cleaner every 4,000 miles destroys harmful deposits to help restore gas mileage. A winning combination to help restore peak performance in any gasoline vehicle. STP. Science. Technology. Performance. G'day America, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. That's right, Outback Delivery is here. 
Now you can enjoy all your Outback favourites anywhere. Our signature centre cut sirloin at home. It's here. Or game day party platters with kookaburra wings that'll have both teams cheering. It's here. Or steak and lobster for a date night at home. It's here. Head over to Outback.com and place your orders because Outback delivery is here. Outback Steakhouse. Aussie rules. Delivery availability varies. Delivery charge may apply. Bubba Wallace bringing the legendary Penny Colors up the back straight away. Bubba Wallace here. You know winning doesn't just happen overnight. To finish first, everything needs to come together to create the perfect combination. STP understands that. Using advanced formula, STP Ultra 5-in-1 Fuel System Cleaner every 4,000 miles destroys harmful deposits to help restore gas mileage. A winning combination to help restore peak performance in any gasoline vehicle. STP. Science. Technology. Performance. Back on MRN Out Loud, it is STP Week here on the Motor Racing Network as we get set for the action at Martinsville Speedway this coming weekend. And we're talking a little spotting history right now. And earlier, Joey, not on this show, but when we were at lunch, you told me about spotting for the first time or early on for the Rolex, the Rolex 24, back when they didn't really have them. And, Keith, you've done that as well. But tell the folks about that because I think yeah, that's really cool well, how that came about. 2019, 2018, 17. Uh, when everybody goes down to the 24-hour race at Rolex, they go down for a test. They go down for the following week for the big race. Mm-hmm. Spotters now are a huge part of that. Well, back in the early 2000s when Dale Dill Jr. and Kelly Collins and Andy Pilgrim and them guys were driving for the factory Corvette, they didn't have spotters back then. Dale brought a couple of us, Ty Norris and myself, down to Daytona, and we spotted from inside Mr. Francis Sweet. <laughs> Did and, they know and, you? And, well, you know, <laughs> but the interesting thing was we weren't spotting because we were trying to be safe. It was the fact that there were four different uh, types of cars on the track, and the prototypes would drive so much deeper into the corner mm-hmm. that that's what you were protecting your driver to pre- prevent from getting overrun, right? Mm-hmm. From the, Here comes a really fast car. Exactly yeah. right. So that was kind of a – we were very on the cutting edge at the time spotting for the 24-hour race. Now, you did, did you now, do the whole 24 at so the time? So we, we split. So we had three drivers or three spotters between all of us. So we did, you know, essentially six-hour or four-hour segments six times mm-hmm. a day. So – uh, we made the whole 24 hours, uh, but we sat inside Mr. Francis' suite. He had a chef cooking us omelets <laughs> and hot dogs, and we had a cot sitting there. So that was it was really cool, yeah. but n- that was uh, very unusual in 2001. Mm-hmm. Now it's the way of life it is. And whenever those guys down, man, everybody's phone rings. I get a call every year, hey, can you make it to Daytona? Because all they want to use is, is you know NASCAR cup spotters. All right. And what about you, Keith? You've done you've done the Rolex as well, right? That's, I have. I that's probably, a, it's a bucket list item, but man, it's it grueling. Is. I, I was just getting ready to say it is probably one of the you know going to the Brickyard the first time is mm-hmm. just, was just amazing yep. walking out on pit road, and and the twenty four hour race. I tell everybody when we're talking at the racetrack when you get an opportunity, do it once at, at least mm-hmm. once because. You know, you go into the, there's, they have a big tent, they've got food, and I'm sitting there having lunch. And, you know, Emerson Fittipaldi mm. is sitting at the same table. And you're like, okay, I'm a historian guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love yeah. the old stuff. Oh, yeah. And I'm thinking. And then for know, folks who don't know, the, the pit boxes aren't like NASCAR at the Rolex. They're like big rooms. They're yeah, like oh, yeah. tents. And yeah. you go into a room. It's not like you can get in there and see all the way up and down pit road. Sure. I've it's lived like in a house smaller rooms. than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. My first apartment wasn't that big. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They, but, they, they set them up for 24 hours. I mean, yeah. You're there. You're living yeah. And they Yeah, they do. They live in there. They have sure. food in there. They have all kinds of stuff going on, like a, a ton of people in each one of those. Right. And and one one of the cool things is with the road racing guys, they are so appreciative of what we do for them. You know, I remember we had Butch Leitzinger mm-hmm. in a road course car back in the Diamond Ridge days. And we go to Watkins Glen and he's, you know, goes through the S's and I'm like, all right, you're all clear on exit. Everything's good. He's like, thank you. <laughs> I'm like, well, you're welcome. I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. Come yeah. on back. Yeah. Yeah. But, but those guys, they're so appreciative for what you do and, because they're just not used to it. Yeah, they know? hadn't had that. They had not had that point. We're, again, we're a luxury. It's yeah. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, we had more than one radio. Here we are. Now yeah, exactly. take this one and from. go on. Exactly. Um, tell me something. Joey was mentioning all the radios and equipment that that you have to take up there with you now. Have you had a situation where everything just went to pieces? No, but I have seen a situation. Uh oh. <laughs> so it was it was a friend. Right? It, it, well, yeah. it was. Yeah. It was uh, Chuck Joyce. Yep. Our buddy Chuck Joyce that used to spot for the Wood Brothers. So we're at Pocono, and we're all up on the roof, which 
look the same then as it does now. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> it's just not a bit <laughs> different. Right, for you traditionalists out there. Yeah. Absolutely. So we, we hear the national anthem, and Chuck turns around to his bag, and he's going to pick up, get his radios out. Mm-hmm. Now, you get your radios out and check them an hour before the race. Yes. Just to make know. sure nothing's and wrong. And then you and... stack up a bunch of batteries to be sure mm-hmm. I can change this in, you know, 0.3 seconds if mm-hmm. I have to. You're like quick practice draw, your quick draw. Quick yeah. draw will yeah. yeah, exactly. battery. <laughs> exactly. You say clear, and then it's like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like you cock a gun. There was only a little hitch there. That's right. it. Yeah. So Chuck turns around, and he looks at everybody and says, okay, who did it? <laughs> I look at Chuck, and I'm like, what, what are, are you talking, talking about? about? Yeah. He said, who's got my radios? <laughs> I said, Chuck. I swear to you, I have not touched your radio bag. So look, every, he's looking at you right he's away. He's looking at me. He's standing beside okay, of me. Okay, I'm yeah. like, you know, I, I wish I would have thought about hiding yeah. them, but I didn't. Yeah, you know, yeah. so I'll remember that for next time. So he tells me, yeah, on the he said, get on your radio and tell Eddie Wood because we're close enough to him on pit road. Tell mm-hmm. someone to tell Eddie, I don't have radios. So they literally they crank the engines, they roll down pit road. Eddie Wood jumps the wall, runs over to the fence at Pocono, and hands Chuck his radios through the fence. Oh, my gosh. And, and, I'm, willing, and I'm willing to bet they were on charge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie might have been on, been in on the trick. Yeah. But he literally hands them through the fence, which they would not allow you to right, do right, that today. Right. But they would have also parked his car. Right, because right. he wasn't ready exactly. with a spotter before exactly. the race. So where did the radios wind up being? You know, I, I think he left him on the charger. Yeah. Really, I okay. really he did. Left yeah. them. See okay. that? See that's like again. That's the difference of it now. I have chargers at my house. Mm-hmm. Right, all my batteries. When I got home last night, I take them out. Just the batteries are being charged. Mm-hmm. My radios with other batteries are still in my radio bag. <laughs> right, we didn't have extra batteries. And in reality, you, know, you probably have a portable charger that goes to the hotel with you. Well, they're, but but they're in the in the trailer. <laughs> sure. So the trailer exactly. has a charger. My house has a charger, mm-hmm. and I have more batteries. So it's the mentality of what we used to do. 20 years ago, yeah. it's just way different. You ever have that moment in the middle of the night in a hotel room where you go, <gasps> oh, my radios aren't charged. Always. Oh, yeah. Every, yeah, every spotter on the roof has the dream. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, am I the only one that's naked? In the <laughs> 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 but, but, but we all have lost our radios at the national anthem. Like, oh. that's every spotter in the world. That's that, the nightmare. That's sure. exactly yeah, right. That is, the, that is it. Yeah. Absolutely. Where do you think we might go in the future? Are we pretty much at max capacity now with what we could do? I know there's multiple spotters at road courses in Indy, for example. Where do you think things go from here? We well, you know one of the things I always swore, and, and the only guy that's ever done it is Tommy Baldwin. I always thought the crew chiefs would call the race from the roof. I, I agree. Hmm. I thought the same thing. And before. I thought because, yeah. because the picture is so much bigger, Unfortunately or fortunately, now we have this device called the SMT, mm-hmm. which gives you live that game data that we've seen on TV mm-hmm. from your pit box. You can look at any driver, any car, and I think that may have reduced their ability to see from the roof because now you have more data in your pit box. Because you can't haul all that stuff conveniently up right. to the roof. Absolutely. But you have so much more data. But I thought the crew chiefs would start calling. There would be more crew chiefs that would call the race from the roof as a spotter, right? Mm-hmm. So you'd have a crew chief slash spotter on the roof, and Tommy Baldwin's the only one that I've seen do that so far. When right. was that? Uh, yeah, so I ran just some. Uh, you know, ran a that, seven car full yeah, time. Yeah, seven. Okay. When uh, TBR has that team, yeah. the thirty six car. So sure. Um, sure. But he was the one of the first guys to ever do it, and and I. But I thought I would see more of that happening. Now I will tell you something that's changed also on Saturday. Usually, you don't really pay a lot of attention to it, but in Daytona. You will see a couple of drivers on the roof, mm-hmm. like I have seen drivers come yep. up there just to get that perspective for the yep. Xfinity race, or even you know they'll come up for the first duel, fifteen yeah. laps of yep. a duel. Yep. Yeah, or exactly. They want to look at what lines guys are sure. using and stuff, sure. and yeah. just get a better perspective of what we can see. That's it. You know, it's kind of it's kind of like Pocono. If you clear a guy getting into one at Pocono, you're you, lying. You just lied to him. You just, lied. <laughs> yeah, you, just uh, you know, it's you can a, say you're clear now, but in I can't help you. In a, a thousand few feet, yards, I yeah. can't help you. And yeah. it's yeah. funny we use Pocono. I was spotting for Eric Amarola uh, over at DEI in an ARCA car. We go down to poke. We go down to turn one. There's a wreck, and I'm like, "You okay?" And all of a sudden, I see him come out of the corner. He's like, "It's okay, Joey. I remember you." He was on the roof the day before, seeing what I could not see. Wow. Exactly. And he he yeah. understood what I couldn't see. So yeah, yeah, everything was fine. But yeah, if you're if you're clearing somebody into turn one, you're definitely lying. Yeah. Uh, at Pocono is such a great example to use. <laughs> so we're at Pocono, and I'm spotting for Bill Elliott in mm-hmm. the Bud Car. So those were the days. Oh, it was yeah. great. Mm-hmm. It was great. He, by the way, he is like. 
unbelievable. He yeah. knows where everybody is at all times. He knows if they're a lap down. He knows if he's racing them. It's just mm. Without phenom- you having to say anything. Yeah. It's phenomenal the amount of information that Bill has can process in a race car. Right. To this day, we ran him last year. So. Oh, that's right. I forgot <laughs> yeah. about that. Yeah. The rookie. At, uh, at Road America. Yeah, right? yeah I forgot about yeah. that. And he did have to go to the rookie meeting, didn't he? Oh, yeah. He's like, Barnwell, yeah. you got a copy. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. Uh, before we wrap it up here, guys, uh, look ahead for us at Martinsville this weekend. The trucks are coming back. Uh, the Xfinity cars are not running this weekend. What can we look for with this new package? I don't think it's going to be much different than traditional Martinsville, will it? I don't see a difference in it. Uh, it's the truck race, and it's one of those races that for a number of years, I always hated the truck race at Martinsville. Uh, this used to be the second race of the year for mm-hmm. a long time. We'd go to Daytona, and then we'd take a big break off. and I really Like thought, a month. Right, and then guys would lose their minds and, and lack of patience, and the second race of the year was really sloppy. Since we've added some races in between that, now guys have gotten into more of a rhythm. It becomes a very good competitive race, and the way the trucks are built – they love beating and banging. Mm-hmm. They love touching doors and fenders without beating the sides off of them and really causing tire rubs. So I like the truck race now at Martinsville, and it gives the opportunity. We're going to see a number of drivers making their initial start in the truck series because it offers such a good opportunity to get experience. Yeah, and a lot of these younger guys need some of those races before they can get cleared to do more. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. If you uh, if you want to go to school really quick, go to Martinsville for the truck race because yeah. I'm telling you, it's it's exciting and guys learn how to race at places like that. Yeah, one of the best thing about Martinsville, too, is the younger kids go, oh, I know I can get Martinsville. I, it's, it's what I'm used to driving at a short track. Oh. And then they show up and they go, oh, my God, I don't know where I'm at here. Yeah. They overdrive the corners. They use too much brakes. They use too much throttle. They use too much of everything mm-hmm. because they realize it's only a half a mile and they know what they're doing. It's a very steep learning curve to go to Martinsville, so it's a really good track to start at. Yeah, Absolutely. it's going to be a lot of fun. And then not long after that, we head to Bristol. Yeah, separates yeah, the man from the And that will too. be different with the new package. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll talk sure. a little bit more about that as we go. Well, Keith, thanks for coming by and enlightening us a little bit, giving us some of the history of spotting. Folks uh, who want to check out more, MRN.com is your place. STP Week here on the Motor Racing Network. We've got truck racing on Saturday. I'll actually be in the booth for that one with Dave Moody. Then on Sunday, Hannah Newhouse is going to be filling in for Kim Poon on our pre-race show. Check MRN.com for all the scheduling information. Make sure you're there. And join us right back here next week on MRN Out Loud. If you're listening on a Monday, don't forget, little Joey says, it is Outback Steakhouse time. Go by and get that free Bloomin' Onion because Kevin Harvick paid it off with another top ten. I'm Woody. He's Joey. That's Keith. We'll see you next week on MRN Out Loud.